Hey guys, welcome back to the podcast. Uh, today's episode is going to be a mover and a shaker. Before we jump in to introducing the episode, I want to thank you guys for being here. I want to thank you for being part, a member of my audience and for all the comments and the feedback that I'm getting on the show these days. It is just amazing. And I also want to let you know that this fall, I'm going to be launching a solo episode series. So if you have any burning questions that you would like included in that solo episode series, please make sure that you reach out to me through my website or even on Instagram at Natalie Nidham and send me your questions and I will be sure to try and work them in or include them or who knows, even build an episode, a solo episode around your questions. So <clears throat> That's a little bit of appreciation for you guys. And also, if you get value from this episode, please make sure that you that you share it with your friends, your family. And if you're feeling inspired, make sure to leave us a review. And last but not least, make sure to visit natnidham.com where you can learn about my membership community on Mighty Networks called the BSP Community. And on my website, you will also see a retreat tab. If you're a woman looking for a longevity and resilience retreat this fall, then you might want to check out and see if we still have some spots available. I know we have a couple left when I'm recording this, but um, there's still a couple of spots up for grabs and it is going to be epic. Okay, let's talk a little bit about our episode. If you've ever suffered from joint pain or inflammation, you know just how much it can take a toll on your quality of life. Whether you're an athlete suffering from a sports-related injury, or if you're someone who's noticed more and more aches and pains as you've gotten older, finding a solution to joint pain can almost seem impossible. And we know that there's lots of supplements and things you can do, but sometimes that's just not enough. And luckily, my guest today is here to talk about a light therapy device that is a game changer for pain management. I'm joined by Forrest Smith, the CEO of Kineon Labs, to dive into the benefits of using light therapy to reduce joint pain. We discuss how localized inflammation has the potential to spread through the body if not addressed, and how red light and laser can target specific reservoirs. We also talk about the balance of cartilage regrowth and degradation and the benefits of Kineon Labs Move Plus Pro. Forrest Smith has a 20-year history of building successful startups in tech hardware. He's an entrepreneurial optimist and passionate about health, wellness, and advancing technology to help others. And he's just genuinely a really good guy. The whole team at Kineon are really amazing people. And Forrest speaks, reads, and writes fluent Chinese and has spent his adult life building amazing products around innovative supply chains. He grew up playing competitive sports in Atlanta, regularly participates in rugby matches, and trains CrossFit which if you know anything about CrossFit and rugby, you will not be surprised to learn that this is what ultimately led him to develop Kineon's la Kineon Labs Move Plus, a modular targeted laser therapy device for neuromuscular pain and inflammation. So cool offer for listeners of this podcast. If you go to kineon.io and use code NAT10, you will save 10% on your Move Plus. And I can tell you that I've seen this device do amazing things for people with old, stubborn injuries, very specific injuries. And it's the red laser that really enables targeting in a very particular way. All right, without further ado, let's jump into the episode. Hey folks, just a quick reminder that all of the information presented in this podcast is for information purposes only. No medical advice, no diagnosing, no treatments suggested here. Before you try anything that you hear about or learn about here, make sure that you check with your medical provider. Welcome to the show, Forrest. It is such a pleasure to have you here today. Likewise, thank you for having me here. Really, really uh, good to have a chance to talk to you. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, well, you know, and as people know who listen to this podcast, there's generally a podcast before the podcast actually starts. So <laughs> it's been great chatting and it looks, you are in a beautiful, warm part of the world, which you know, we're going to keep it secret because you'd like to, you know, maintain that exclusivity of where you are. <laughs> um, I too am not in my regular office. People will notice the cool art behind me. That is not mine. I wish it was. Um, so we're going to talk today. We're going to really talk, dive into this whole topic of pain and specifically joint pain that people are dealing with. And so um, maybe you can just start there. Like, you know, you as a company have really taken a really interesting approach to solve helping people to solve for for pain specifically joint pain. So maybe take us through a little bit of this 
this whole issue that people are dealing with with uh, with their joints. Absolutely. And I think uh, one of the things that I'll, I'll start off with on that is that it's uh, it relates back very heavily to our mission as a company, uh, which we've developed. My partner and I both have, have kind of built companies before, focus on commercial outcomes. And, and this company is really a mission-driven uh, company with the, the focus and the mission being to increase the quality of life in the most substantial way we can for the largest number of people we can. And that's how we measure ourselves. We've chosen that specifically because it's it's measurable and it holds us accountable uh, in, in a real way to what our outcomes are and what we're doing for people on a daily basis for all of our users. And how that relates to pain, uh, pain and particularly chronic pain are a are a scourge. It's it's um, you know in in conjunction with inflammation, uh, you see these things wrecking people's lives. Um, they they create an environment where um, addiction uh, and uh, really there's not any good choices uh, available for for dealing with chronic pain. And so this is one of the things that we wanted to address and felt like really meets our mission of moving the needle from a quality of life uh, standpoint for our our users and. Um, the, the technology has been here for some time. There's been professional uh, laser devices uh, that are, are very well designed, um, but they haven't been widely adopted because they're starting at about $20,000. And you'll see them in great clinics. Um, and, and two things uh, have kind of driven our selection of this uh, this type of technology as a, as a basis for our neuromuscular pain and inflammation products. One is, is there's a, a gap uh, in the market for what's available. On one hand, there was a, a there are commercial products with panels uh, that don't penetrate, that are LED only, um, that, that are hard to treat internal tissue with. Uh, and on the other hand, there are these professional devices, which are you know, $20,000 starting. And for most people, that's going to be prohibitive for using it on a daily basis. Um, and so we felt like there's a gap to where we can reduce the cost and still meet those clinical levels of dosing with the lasers. But also, our, our goal with the product design was to make it as low friction as possible. Mm -hmm. So with the assumption that based on lower friction, more people will adopt it. Based on uh, lower price, more people will adopt it. And when you provide people with uh, results, they're going to help you expand the adoption of the actual technology and get people away from the, the existing, uh, provide them an alternative for the existing pharmaceutical solutions for this, which yeah. is, you know, opioids, NSAIDs, all of which have a really heavy toll on the body. So yeah. uh, I hope that's, that's not too long from a, uh, an answer standpoint, but it's something that's really kind of uh, close to our, our heart from a, a mission and execution standpoint. For sure. No, and the NSAIDs we know destroy the gut, which in and of itself will drive inflammation in the body. Yes. I mean, it's it's such a vicious circle, right? And then the opioids, well, everybody knows that they're, you know, we're in the midst of a massive opioid crisis. And you know, imagine, and not to mention the fact that they don't solve the problem, right? Perfect. So so maybe now let's talk a little bit about laser, red lasers, because that's the area that you, you're you in. And I know that there's red lasers, blue lasers, green, there's different color lasers for different applications. So maybe we can talk a little bit about red lasers and what they're really great at. How do people tell a good red laser from a bad red laser? You know, what what are the, what are the kind of intricacies of that specific modality? that really addresses the issues that people are dealing with? Absolutely, no, it's, it's a great question. I, I think the the way that we've uh, approached the issue is most of the, the um, that so, so first of all, dosing uh, with lasers is very much like dosing with pharmaceuticals uh, in that if it's it operates based on what they call a biphasic dose curve, which means that increasing the level of dosage up to a certain point is going to increase the positive outcome. And then past that point, it's going to decrease the positive outcome. Interesting. And so it'll get you back to zero. So you really have to dose effectively. And to do that, we started off in, in the same way that most manufacturers of laser devices started off, which is what are we putting out? So you you have uh, there's different metrics by which you can measure the the power density or the irradiance uh, of the optical power that you put out of the devices. These are engineering terms, and as we started getting into these, what we found is that this didn't really give us a a good grasp on what we're impacting from a physiology standpoint. Mm -hmm. For us to be able to provide these outcomes for people in a meaningful and substantial and consistent way, we have to know what we're targeting and when we're targeting what we're delivering. 
And to do that, we've built a light distribution model, uh, which started again with it started with a spreadsheet and went to a Python code. And, and now we're in a really, it's, it's gone through multiple iterations that have made it more and more complex. But what we really do with that is there are photo acceptors for different colors of, of light. Like you said, green, blue, ultraviolet, uh, you know, red, infrared, all have different photo acceptors within the body. There are different reservoirs of these photo acceptors at different levels of the tissue. So in the outer skin, in the blood, and the muscle, uh, in the fat, you have different reservoirs of these photo acceptors. What we've done is optimized our dosing with red and infrared lasers uh, to be able to penetrate to the correct, correct depth where these reservoirs exist with the correct dosage that provides the optimal outcome. And so uh, one of the things that we've, we've done that actually helps us dial that in some is we've put in place uh, different metrics for measuring the physiological outcomes versus just measuring the, the, uh, the output of the actual device. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of those, as an example, is nitric oxide. So you, we can measure nitric oxide uh, in the blood. And nitric oxide, uh, so one of the things that, that uh, infrared um, light does, as an example, is it interacts with heme proteins uh, like hemoglobin or like some other heme proteins in the, in the mitochondria called cytochrome C oxidase. Yeah. Um, these heme proteins are, are binding sites for both oxygen and nitric oxide. By targeting them and dosing them with infrared light, we reduce the affinity of nitric oxide for these binding areas and allow them to access more oxygen. But also when you, when you reduce that affinity, you dump a bunch of uh, nitric oxide into the blood, uh, which, yeah, it's, it's amazing that the number of, of things that we target and are able to trigger from a signaling standpoint is, is crazy. And it's also, it's also interesting just from a, a um, again, we we're all about accountability and measurement, kind of letting the science determine which way the product design goes, but it's, it's, Kind of odd that people in who are who are creating devices, whether laser or uh, LED devices, haven't really calculated out these. Um, and it, it it's a big effort. It's been tens of thousands of hours, but haven't calculated out the correct dosages to be able to deliver the type of results, and then tested them and measured them. And so that's that's kind of where we live is in in that space between the physiology and the technology, and measuring it to to be able to provide the most optimal outcomes we can. Okay. So, so let's talk a bit. So the red light, so basically, so red laser targets specific reservoirs that inhabit, in this case, we're talking about joints. So in the cartilage, in the ligaments, in the, or is it, do the, do the reservoirs, that's, I mean, I've never heard it described that way. So I find that really interesting. It's a great concept, right? It's a, it's a really nice way because you can imagine that, you know, there's these places, they're like binding sites, right? Essentially. Um, and so the red light, the red laser is the specific light that's going to target those reservoirs in the joint. It's going to release nitric oxide, which is going to improve blood flow, blood supply, the whole nine yards to the area I'm gathering and free up that receptor for oxygen, which again, we bring oxygen in. This is a benefit, helps with ATP production and all the, all the things. So so now, so, so you, but you've partnered red light with near the red laser with, is it just red light or is it near infrared light? Is this, it must be a very specific um, band. I'm, I'm, I'm getting the idea from you that you guys are very specific in terms of what, what you're targeting. So what, which band of the spectrum did you decide to go with on the red light for this? That, that's exactly right. So we've we've actually used infrared lasers and red LEDs, but the red LEDs we've also used in a way to control the angle of emission. So standard red LEDs are 120 degree uh, angle of emission. It's called a Lambertian pattern. And actually, they, the LED die or the LED chips that emit the light emit in all directions, and they're they're packaged into a a ceramic or plastic uh, PLCC package is what they call those, and that controls it back to 120 degrees. What we found is to bring more uh, surface level uh, blood into the area and promote angiogenesis, new blood blood vessel growth into tissue where the delivery is not fantastic, uh, where the tissue has been some kind of traumatic tissue damage in that area, in the local area, uh, bringing the red um, red LED light into the body uh, actually brings more more 
um, blood to this area that supports the, the higher levels of penetration from the infrared light. So the infrared light that we're using right now is an infrared laser. Uh, they're, they're called vertical cavity surface emission lasers. Mm -hmm. And they, they emit in, uh, in a little bit tighter pattern, uh, collimated light in a 10 by 20 degree, uh, ellipse shape. Uh, and those penetrate much more effectively than even than the controlled tight band LEDs that we're using with the red. So the red penetrates towards the surface level, gets more blood into the area and the infrared penetrates further into the actual joint, into things like the synovial cavity, uh, reducing inflammation and increasing the rate of growth of cartilage in the space. Okay. Well, that's interesting. So <laughs> talk to me about that. Like, are you, you know, in any of your research or now anecdotally in what you're seeing in the market, are you actually seeing repair or regrowth of cartilage? Yeah. So your, your cartilage is always growing. It just grows very slowly relative to other, other tissue. It's a slow growth uh, kind of tissue in your body, kind of like bones. And they grow in a very similar way uh, with bones. Uh, they, they have uh, some fast growth uh, cells called chondroblasts uh, yeah. that essentially we can uh, we can increase the the rate of chondroblast proliferation uh, with the the infrared and red light treatment um, and so the chondroblasts form and then as they as they uh, age they embed themselves they start building uh, this extracellular matrix of fiber uh, which is essentially kind of the fibrous cartilage material that you that you think of as cartilage um, mm -hmm. as they build that out around themselves. They grow down and embed into this extracellular matrix. So what happens with uh, regrowth is that it never really stops, um, but you have a balance of, of uh, regrowth and degradation. If you have inflammation in your joint from having had a previous injury or for whatever reason, the degradation rate is higher mm -hmm. and the regrowth rate will be lower. What we do is reduce the inflammation rates uh, so that you can actually reduce that degradation factor and increase the chondroblast uh, proliferation. So you're, you're doing it, you're kind of hitting that balance on both ways and, and really increasing, if people are at a deficit right now where they've been losing with age, with use, with overuse in some cases, losing that cartilage over time, they, uh, they can actually start to bring that balance into a positive uh, uh, generative growth space and replace the, the the tissue over and this is this is not you know a magic pill it doesn't happen overnight no. but this is a, a you know three to six month period uh and you'll see this particularly with daily use of the device you'll see this very consistently this is something where particularly with things like osteoarthritis um and in osteoarthritis that, that is often based around old joint injuries mm -hmm. uh, you can reduce that inflammation that chronic inflammation that's damaging the joint over time and causing the osteoarthritis and again benefit the cartilage regrowth in the area that's amazing and so how long is the how long have you been in the market now uh, so we launched our first product, the Move Plus with an Indiegogo campaign uh, in October of 2021 we started delivering in August of 2022. And so far, I think we've delivered about seven or 8,000 devices worldwide wow. since last August. And so, I mean, I know that I gave my device to someone with a chronic knee injury and he was blown away and he only had it for two weeks. So just for people to know, like, you know, although, you know, because the next question I'm gonna ask you, you may not have the answer to it because it, there just hasn't been enough time. But definitely from a symptomatic perspective, the results that this guy, this is a two-year-old, you know, post-surgical knee, you know, swollen knee, lack of range, like a restriction in his range of motion, a lot of pain, makes it hard for him to work out, which of course becomes a self-fulfilling, like a self-feeding cycle. Um, and he said that he noticed a difference, like almost the first time he put the device on. but. Um, are you seeing like, like, I guess the question is, has there been enough time elapsed or do you have enough testing under your belt to know, to say, you know, we're seeing lasting results or are people just using it every single day for however many minutes to keep those results going? I think we advise them to keep using it um, because it's also going to just kind of promote that, that healthier growth of tissue in the area and restrict kind of the, that there's a number of different things that happen with aging in joints. And particularly when you have some kind of traumatic 
tissue damage, whether it's the injury or the surgery to repair the injury. And there's a, a just one note on that that we've seen quite a lot uh, is uh, there was a big NFL study that, that uh, a friend of ours was uh, a part of as a researcher where the inflammation that is, and, and I don't think this is widely known. I, I was it, I was unaware of this, and, and um, I, I spent quite a lot of time in the medical literature. But uh, the inflammation that happens locally in a joint doesn't stay local. Uh, and so a couple of the things that we see from that are, one is regional impacts, and we've been measuring with some of our, our professional athletes that we work with, uh, temperature differences. So when you have inflammation leaking out of a local area, like a, a knee that's undergone surgery, you'll find the quad, the muscles above the knee in that leg and the, the injured leg will be one to two degrees colder than the tissue in the healthy leg. And in, in digging into this uh, from a, a um, microscopy standpoint, what it turns out is that this actually, this inflammation impacts the microvasculature and the delivery of blood to that tissue, uh, not just in the local area, but in the region. And, uh, you know, it's one of the things that we actually impact very positively and have been able to turn around for people in a, in a four to six week period. But the, the other thing that's even more, I think, scary is, and, and, and still kind of not known by a number of, by, by the majority of people, I think, is um, this is not just local or regional. It's also systemic. So, the study that I mentioned with the NFL players, they had uh, retired players, uh, roughly 50% had had an ACL injury and the 50% hadn't. Uh, the 50% that had had the ACL injury had a 50% increase in their um, occurrence of severe cardiovascular disease. Uh, and the interpretation of this, and, and they're still digging into it, but the, the early interpretation of this from the medical community has been that that locally generated inflammation actually damages not just the regional delivery of blood, but also stiffens the endothelial tissue or your blood vessel tissue throughout the rest of your body. And that's a, a really big cause of long-term cardiovascular disease. And it's something that using devices like ours, you can actually treat now so that decades down the, the, uh, the road, you don't have that increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Right. So basically by addressing the localized inflammation, you're preventing it from spreading to the rest of the That's system. Right. It's funny because right. you know, I think people don't think of their injuries that way, right? They think of their injuries as, oh, my knee is sore, my knee's messed up. But it's we don't typically make that transition to the inflammation in my knee is going to affect other parts of my body. I mean, I think there's a segment of the population that's kind of figuring it out. Like even when you look at um, oral health, right? Yes. This, this whole narrative that having issue, you know, gum disease, whether it's diagnosed or not affecting the rest of your body. Yes. It's it, powerful. And, and, you know, you see the same thing with the, the, uh, the gum disease and the, the microbiome, uh, the oral microbiome, and you see it with the gut microbiome. And it, there's, there's so much, uh, interconnectedness, uh, in our bodies, um, that, that needs to be, uh, kind of comprehensively addressed to be able to to maintain long term health. Um, sorry, I had a uh, had a had a horn going off here. Um, but yeah, they, this interconnectedness is something that I, I think people are finding more and more now, and and we're seeing. Uh, it, it actually brings us to a good point. We we have a, a new product we'll be launching this year uh, for gut health and vagal tone health uh, for for managing these from a sympathetic and parasympathetic impacts for the body and for the brain. But a number of things that you do, whether it's in the in the oral microbiome or in the gut microbiome, actually cross the blood brain barrier as well and can have neurological impacts on you from a longer term standpoint. And so, uh, you know, we we've the tools that we've had to date have been limited with regards to how we can start addressing these issues comprehensively. Uh, but um, they're starting to build out and, and, you know, we feel really lucky to be part of that, uh, to be able to, to kind of start bringing tools to people where they can be empowered to treat themselves in a more comprehensive way and structure what, what they're doing on a daily basis from a habit standpoint. This is, this has been huge for a lot of our, our existing chronic pain sufferers is structuring habits and stacking them. So you don't, lose time out of your day, you, you, these, these devices and these tools need to be uh, as frictionless as possible. And so whether it's, you know, your, your morning meditation or your morning coffee or your evening Netflix, you don't need to go to the, to a, a, um, a medical lab to go use 
top quality devices, these need to be in people's homes and they need to have the empowerment to be able to make that a part of their habits and part of their day. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. And definitely like, you know, something like uh, the Kineon, because it's so light and tiny, um, it's just very easy to just strap it on. And it actually, you know, again, because I didn't bring it with me because I didn't have, I didn't, I didn't have an issue that I needed to deal to, to address, but it would be really easy thing to throw in a bag and take on a trip. Um, now, what was I going to ask you? So now let's, let's, um, let's talk a little bit about the actual Kineon. I mean, so it's three, three modules. Like it's, if you guys, if you can imagine this, it's like, it's a strap and the strap has three red light units on it. And you can, I guess you can slide them around so that you can position them. And the idea is, and maybe you can speak to this a little bit. The idea is to address the, the joint or the injury from mul multiple points, right? That's right. That's right. The, we're trying to overlap very targeted, the, these lights. Yeah. We, we were trying to overlap these beams. So each, each module has 10 lasers and eight narrow beam led uh, emitters on them. And what we've tried to do because every, every depth of tissue, every inch you go into tissue, every centimeter you go into tissue, you lose through either absorption or refraction. Uh, some of that light is to be able to allow people to overlap these uh, around uh, the kind of central tissue uh, in your joints. And, um, you know, it's actually worked out from our dosing model uh, really well. Um, we found that our dosing model actually mapped when we started the dosing model, the, the, amount of light we were trying to get to this uh, seemed like it was going to have to be a little bit higher and that we might need 30 or 45 minute treatment windows to be able to do that in the most effective way. Um, but we found that actually in our testing that we were we were triggering it in a much shorter period of time. Um, and one of the things that's come up in the, the recent literature from a medical testing and trial standpoint is that with animal and cadaver studies, they've, they've actually established that the penetration from the in infrared light is actually much more effective than originally uh, anticipated. And so we're, we're seeing reasonable dosing models to where we're, our, our modules are treating at a six centimeter depth, which is, you know, two, two plus inches, uh, deep, which gets you into the kind of heart of that synovial fluid, uh, or, or joint capsule, depending on what joint you're treating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's amazing. And so what is the dosage? You, we keep, we've been dancing around it for a while. Is it, so we know it's not 35 to 40 minutes because you don't need that because of the multi-pronged approach. Um, so what's the idea? Is it like, is it a 10 minute treatment time or? So we, we, the maximum we recommend is 15 minutes. Um, that would be based on typically, uh, kind of really, really heavy acute injuries or a long-term, um, chronic injury. So typically if you had a chronic injury for a very long period of time, it's indicative of the fact that it's, it's going to be harder to treat that. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then also one other thing that's, that's kind of a variable for this is the amount of tissue around the actual uh, uh, pain or inflammation point. So with knees and hips, um, 10 to 15 minutes uh, is quite enough. Um, and, and again, with those acute injuries, we'll see people, um, you know, some of our professional CrossFitters, for example, will be treating for morning and evening because they're during the day, they're doing a lot of repetitive movements of high stress on these joints. Um, but knees and hips respond very quickly to this uh, because there's so much tissue around them. With things like hands for osteoarthritis, it, it's taking longer. And so we could say up to 20 to 25 minutes for hands. Uh, elbows, actually, elbows are an interesting one because uh, elbows do respond more slowly, but they're also... Um, often a referral pain, a pain. So uh, oh, one of the like things that we've had- in the neck or to the shoulder. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. So we have people treat kind of the the uh, the nerve connections back into the spine, um, just, just to one side. So if it's your right hand to the right side of your spine a little bit and treat those and then treat the shoulder and then treat the elbow. Uh, and and the outcomes for that have been much more effective. Uh, we we see for uh, tennis elbow, elbow um, some folks have a, a golfer's elbow as well. Yeah. Um, uh, different things like pitchers, uh, major league baseball pitchers have oh, loved yeah. this. This, this one of the things that we found is that people who treat, who have like, we can replace um, existing best practices that aren't fantastic, like icing. Uh, so baseball pitchers up until about even five or ten years ago Getting were icing their shoulders, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it just doesn't help. It, it it decreases the blood flow to the area. Um, it reduces the pain in the short term, but from a a um, 
treating the underlying uh, mechanisms of, of what's causing the pain and that inflammation and extending out the healthy horizon of being able to use that joint, the light therapy is so much more powerful. And we, we've got a couple of, and I'll, I'll send you over the links for these, uh, good papers we've put together on kind of cryotherapy or, or cold therapy relative to outcomes, um, what they call the, the ergogenic or muscle protecting, joint protecting outcomes of uh, light therapy is it's night and day. And it's, it's, uh, it's been great for us to start seeing some recognition of that. We're actually working with a couple of major league baseball pitchers who are just shocked that you can't like, how is, how have they, how has no one told them about this uh, until now? Cause it's the results are just night and day. That's amazing. But, but would there not be an argument to maybe use the ice to decrease the physical inflammation and then apply the red lights because you like, I mean, I, I have a couple of questions already. I have a couple of questions and going back a little bit to what you were saying, you were saying, I thought that what you said is you need more tissue around the area for, for, to use the device for less time, which I would have thought would be the opposite. I would have thought that, you know, like I've got this wonky finger, maybe I should be treating this. But like, I would have thought like, it's right on the surface. It's right there. Wouldn't it take less time because the light has nowhere to go? Whereas on a hip, there's more, to your point, there's more tissue around it. That's it's the joint is more, it's buried, if you will, yes. under a lot of yes. fat uh, and fat and muscle. And so I would have thought you need more application time there than you would something like an elbow or a knee that is just, there's just not as much stuff. But I... yes, so, so there's, it's it's very counterintuitive, um, yeah. but it just goes it goes back to the reservoir uh, kind of visualization of think about the reservoirs that we're targeting with this light and how we're going to be impacting them. And if there's less of those reservoirs or there's less water, uh, as an example, in the reservoir, yep. then you can't you can't really target those those photo acceptors. And so the the knock on effects of those and the signaling is going to be less as well. Okay. Well, that's really interesting. And so when somebody's treating the, so on the shoulders, no, is easy. You're going to position your, your three lights. Are there areas of the body that you want to avoid? Like, for example, you're trying to, to hit the spine because that's where the nerves are coming from and are going to affect the rest of the arm. You're, are you going to just keep the lights at the back of the neck and kind of go put them linearly down kind of thing? So following the side of the spine, because what about things like thyroid? Like you wouldn't want to hit your thyroid with this, would you? The, the, there, there's no dangers for hitting the thyroid. Um, there's, there's been a number of studies on this kind of clearing it from um, uh, any negative impacts. Uh, the you, you can trigger some, and I, I'd have to dig back into the literature for this, some changes in thyroid expression uh, from a... a um, uh, from a hormone standpoint, um, and I don't remember those off the top of my head, but there, there was nothing negative about it. it, it, it okay. you know, there would be some changes, but nothing, uh, nothing uh, very negative. Actually, one of the things that we've seen with a lot of our, our um, biohacker friends is, is people want to use this with methylene blue and put it on their neck uh, to, to treat uh, from a, a blood standpoint, and yeah. have found uh, you know very positive uh, outcomes for that for what they were looking for. And again, that's that's not something that we really. So again, I, to come back to our mission, we're we're here to kind of improve the quality of life for people. That's yeah. the kind of <laughs> kind of taking people from the ninety eight percent to the hundred and five percent from a, a brain function standpoint it is great, and I, I I do think that it's it's awesome to pe see people using it in that way. But what we're really targeting is getting people an alternative for. You know, the, the idea that when you have osteoarthritis in your knees, uh, that you're never going to have that better, that that joint will never be better than it is today. It's only going to degrade further is is a terrible kind of unempowering power leaching type mm. uh, perspective. And when you can give people a a tool to be able to treat that so that they know that they're going to be healthier from a joint standpoint, from a movement standpoint, a year from now than they are today, that's that's completely different than anything we've seen in the market from a pharmaceutical standpoint. Yeah. And it really gives people a, a hope to, again, uh, do the opposite of that that downward spiral, right? Yeah. When you when you use these devices, you can start walking again. And the motion is lotion, as they say. The Absolutely. scientific advisory... <laughs> Sorry, I was just going to say, scientific advisory board is huge on that. They, they really want to see people moving... Uh, more because of uh, the, the reduced pain and inflammation, because what that does is it reduce, re reverses that cycle and you start finding 
oh, I can move more, so I'm going to treat it more because I've got a good positive feedback loop on this, but I can also move more so it's going to be able to give me better range of motion and a further walk for tomorrow and being able to run next week. And so you see people having this, this really positive impact from a psychological standpoint where you feel like with a, with a heavy osteoarthritis or, or rheumatoid arthritis or these, these kind of ongoing uh, joint degradation uh, pathologies that it's, it's depressing. And, you know, when, yeah. when, when you have this, it takes away your power to go do a lot of things that, that you've built into your life. And when you can kind of reintroduce those two people, it, it, it gives that empowerment that, that pushes them into maintaining a more functional uh, movement pattern over decades. Yeah. Well, and you know, the motion is the lotion, which is a great expression. I think the other thing is that as you people, and I actually recorded a podcast with a doctor who's, who's an, she's an uh, um, orthopedic physician. And what she talked about also, which is a little bit what you're saying is people get injured, their doctors is, tell them to go home and rest it and just sit. And yes. The problem with that is you're now no, you're not promoting blood flow to the area. The inflammation just builds. There's things stiffen up and seize, and it exacerbates the problem. From a mechanistic perspective, if you can get it moving, you you're now allowing more blood flow into the area, and that's the only way that the body can really heal. So, one hundred percent, right? Yeah, it's, so it's, not it's... only is the light itself drawing the blood in, but then the movement keeps that going through the through the through the day. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, uh, I'm getting to my my gray hairs and, and old phase of uh, of life now, and it's something it's a transition I've had to make as well. And one of the guys on our scientific advisory board, Marco Vandersteen, uh, is so his his day job. He has um, five physio uh, physio clinics uh, where he kind of helps people heal themselves from a number of different things in Holland. But his day job is keeping million dollar uh, soccer players on the field. Uh, mm -hmm. So he works with Premier League football uh, in Europe. And this is the first thing that he told me. I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm still playing rugby and training CrossFit, which is probably two of the the uh, the higher injury <laughs> things that you can <laughs> that yeah. you can do. But his point is, if you want to be able to do that in the near future and continue doing it for for decades to come, uh, you can't take time off. Uh, you have to address these injuries that you have, whether it's a, a tweaked knee or or a sprained ankle or a a um, uh, a, a bone bruise on the shoulder or whatever it is, you have to move. You have to be able to uh, incorporate as much as you can uh, movement patterns that are going to promote that blood flow and get you back into a meaningful movement uh, much faster. And I would say that by doing that, um, I, I, uh, I have lower back, uh, I tore lower back muscle when I was younger wrestling. And so I'll have my, my lower back go out occasionally now. Um, and it, it's gone from a three month problem where if you just take the rest time, it does seize up and the spasming takes longer to get through. And then the healing takes longer to get through to about a two week, uh, uh kind of treatment plan. And that's, that's really just the, the light. And then the, the movement, uh, being able to get more blood back into the area. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's changed my life. It's allowed me to kind of keep up, uh, you know, sports that I, I probably would have had to stop by now otherwise. Yeah, no, I I have to admit I did give up CrossFit a few years ago. I got a little tired. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. I mean, I you love the thing about CrossFit is it's the community that I think yeah. you just don't you, like it, it attracts a certain type of person. You just don't get that community almost anywhere else. And maybe it's just people beating each other up, be, beating <laughs> themselves up, um, you know, giving each other the moral support. So okay, so fifteen minute treatment time. And you had talked earlier about the a point of diminishing return. So is that like twice a day kind of thing or, or like, That's right. like for, and, and you can, sorry, like <laughs> acute, for an acute injury or maybe even post-surgical, like, let's talk a little bit also about using it. Like sometimes look, whatever, whatever happens, happens, you have to go under the knife. Do you, I would think, I mean, I know that red light can definitely help with healing in like wounds, surgical wounds, stuff like that. Do you have any types of protocols around that that you can share? I mean, obviously we're not giving medical advice and you know, you always have to check with your physician to make sure that it'll work for you. But do you want to talk, speak to that a little bit? Like how fast people should jump on Absolutely. the left? <laughs> so so uh, there's a couple of things that will impact. Um, 
One is wound healing generally is accelerated. Um, and it's, it's amazing to see. Uh, and I think it's, it's something that we don't really promote with our device because I, I think there are other devices out there that, that carry the same uh, capability from a, a red light delivery standpoint where ours with the joints is, is very, um, we have some devices at my house and if my kids fall down, uh, and scrape their arms or cut something, they, they just call it the Wolverine device because they, they put it on and they're, they're good in like a day the, the wound yeah. healing is amazing. So at the surface level, the wound healing is great. The other thing that will happen is depending on what kind of surgery you'd be having, the, uh, scar tissue, it promotes healthier scar tissue formation. Uh, so smaller, more flexible, healthier scar tissue. And then the recovery from an internal standpoint is also really good. So we've seen uh, a number of things. Um, and, and there's, there's also a couple of protocols that we're, we're just now finding from our own trials with uh, professional athletes that have been amazing as well. So in accelerating that, that healing process. And so just to kind of give you one where we see an additive growth with, you know, if you, if this is your baseline and, and maybe it's going to be three to four months of, of recovery uh, from a, a meniscus surgery, um, being able to add on light therapy increases the, the kind of blood distribution there, increases the rate of, of uh, healing, uh, improves the, the quality of scar tissue, just makes the joint a lot healthier longer term. If you add on top of that, um, either PRP, PRP is one of the ones that's come up in, in medical studies, in a large medical studies, um, multiple times in the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, the, and, it, and it's additive. This is, this is one of the most powerful ones that we've seen from a medical study on this is the, uh, they, they took uh, athletes who were non-responders uh, for tendinopathies with PRP and then had them do PRP again with light therapy and then also just light therapy. And the light therapy was better than the PRP, uh, you know, non-responders by itself. But when you, when you stacked both of these together, the results were logarithmically better, like really, wow. really powerful outcomes. Um, and PRP is something that's, that's actually relatively widely available in the U S right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, the other thing that's, that's, uh, really powerful is, uh, stem cell. Uh, so I light therapy. Going, I need to talk about stem cells. What about stem cells? <laughs> yeah. So we, we work with some medical professionals who provide stem cell services in the U S but they hadn't been able to do that because of a regulatory environment yeah. until the last few years. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, now that they are able to do it, we we have devices in their hands and they're actually able to give these devices to their patients to take home. So someone will have, you know, again, a meniscus surgery, uh, stem cells, and then every day they're treating it with a targeted device on the on the joint. The outcomes have just been amazing, and we're we're you know these are studies where we're doing observational studies, mm -hmm. but you know this is this is um, you know chiropractors and and physios and and um, orthopedic surgeons who have decades of experience in the space and who are just shocked by the the outcomes that they see from a speed back the speed and quality of the joint back to back to training. So it's, it's really exciting. It's, it's a great thing to be a part of. And again, for those people, it, it really meets our mission of moving the needle from a quality of life standpoint, because there's, there's kind of nothing worse than sitting at home with a, a, uh, a joint surgery uh, kind of recovery that you can't do much about and just having to wait through it where you can now take active steps to accelerate that. So it's, it's been a really encouraging and, and just, it's also just been great to see these guys, um, these professional uh, physicians responding to the treatment so um, positively and emphatically uh, and, and starting to get it on all of their, their patients because of the, uh, the great results. That's awesome. So we talked a lot about athletes um, and high performance athletes, that kind of stuff. But also I would imagine, and I don't, I just, I don't know if you've done any work in this area, but in the aging population, um, again, we see a ton of joint issues, a ton of pain issues. Are, have you done much work in that area as well? Because you we're talking about a population that has, might have other health issues. You know, they're already not moving necessarily as well or as much. Um, have you done any work with those, with any groups of people in that population to, I, I would think it's going to move the needle for them quite nicely as well. A hundred percent. We, we, uh, so one of the things that we assumed, so we, we've got three kind of core audiences that we've seen really adopt the product. Um, one is the, the kind of, uh, elite or, or young 20 to 30 competitive athletes. Then we've got, uh, got kind of the. Uh, middle agers, uh, weekend, weekend warriors, warriors like myself, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and um, and that's that's been great as well. But where we see the largest 
kind of arbitrage for our products in in as an audience in the market is with uh, older, particularly with chronic inflammation and chronic pain uh, audiences. Um, the problem is that uh, it's it's you know it's been harder for us to market to them. Uh, and I think you know just just to kind of give you an example of of what we see is what we we use digital marketing right now, and I think one of our interpretations for this is that the older audiences have been targeted so heavily by kind of scam products. Uh, there's there's a lot of you know crystals and and uh, uh, you know uh, essential oils type things out there, and you know I think because of that they're they're very cynical relative to anything new that's making claims, uh, particularly and and this is this is actually reasonable, particularly to something as amorphous as pain. Pain, it turns out, is something that's really hard to measure objectively, and we're we're doing some things right now with our next generation sensor products that will help with that. Um, but the majority of the the studies that are existing and the majority of the studies that we're doing right now are kind of relativist visual assessment score uh, type, um, you know, zero to ten scale. How much is your pain uh, type thing? Yeah, yeah very yeah. subjective. And and so I, I understand why they're they're very cynical about products making claims in this space. Um, but what we have found is that although our, our digital marketing uh, to these audiences has been slower to grow than, than uh, we, we would have hoped because we feel like we can really do something positive for them, uh, the word of mouth is amazing. Uh, so we just have these, when somebody, when it works for someone, you'll see this uh, kind of bloom, this geographic sales bloom around a certain I geography <laughs> where they've told all their friends. And it's like, you know what, I'll, I'll take it. We're, we're, it's that's but what. what we're we're trying to do is find a way to do that in a on a larger scale because it really is a good way to get people away from uh, opiates and, and NSAIDs, and the the outcomes, you know, it, it's not even equivocal. It's 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 very clear from the literature and from the tests that we've been doing as well that this is actually significantly more effective, um, both in the pain aspect uh, where I feel like a lot of the pharmaceutical solutions we just refer to it as taking the batteries out of the fire alarm, the fire is still burning. Right, you yeah. still have that inflammation. You still have that underlying problem. Such a good analogy, joints. actually. Yeah, that's. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, but it's 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 something where we don't want to see people doing that. Leave your fire alarm uh, fire alarm up. It's going to beep when you have a problem. Let's deal with this underlying problem and get you back into healthier movement patterns. And and um, yeah, it's 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 a challenge for us again from a from how we how we kind of communicate our narrative to people. Um, but it's also a, a really big opportunity because one of the things that we've seen over the past 20 years is the adult onset of osteoarthritis. The average age 20 years ago was 67. Right now it's 52. Wow. Uh, so That's the amount of crazy. talk about going in the wrong direction. Wow. Yes. And so that just means that that you know if it continues going that direction, right now already you see a, like millions more people than there were 20 years ago. Uh, who who have these symptoms, who have this chronic pain, who are looking for a solution. And again, the gold standard for the solutions is ice and uh, NSAIDs, uh, which the NSAIDs actually degrade the joint further. So it's not just that you're you're pulling the the uh, the batteries out of the fire alarm. You're actually tossing a little bit more fuel on that fire by yeah. taking those. Well, not it's, it's cortisone st shots, right? Yes. It directly goes after the connective tissue. Like it's, I know my dad's had some back issues and he, he finally went for a shot. His doctor finally talked him into getting a cortisone shot. And I was like, no, it's just eating at your yes. college. Like it's just, it's just like chewing. I mean, it kills the pain for a while. It does die. Yes. It, yes. it brings some temporary relief, but to your point, on the long term, it's just a completely negative spiral. Um, so actually, so let me ask you one more thing. So another big source of pain, and I think in any population, but definitely in the aging population, and possibly because you get compression in the spine and you get nerves that get impinged. Um, have you, and, and you know, very often that impingement will travel down legs, like people will yes. get nerve pain down their legs. So similar to, you know, whether it's an elbow issue or even uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, right? I would imagine That's also right. has to do with the neck and the shoulder. Um, have you found that applying the light to the spine, the lower spine, like around the sacrum or even a little bit higher, where those nerves are coming out, that that also positively, because people think joints, but I'm thinking 
very often it's the nerves running yes. out of the spine that are that are the problem or they're not passing you know or god forbid you get that supraspinatus nerve in the yes. shoulder get impinged and then it's just but, you know a world of hurt <laughs> yes yes and it's hard to stop and I, I think so so two two points i'd like to address out of that one one is yes it does help because when you what happens when you have those type of uh impingements or, or compressions um so a it doesn't help the the underlying mechanistic compression mm -hmm. but what you'll see around these these compressions is uh additional inflammation that's that's caused by that friction and the compression in the space. Uh, and the, the other thing is that there is a a, uh, a mild reduction um, from a, a pain signaling standpoint. So, and again, this goes back to some, and, and it is significant from the studies that was in, uh, but it's it's in it's in pain studies where there's a lot of kind of um, subjective. Uh, metrics for how they measure this so i would i would without saying you know it doesn't exist i would kind of grain of salt that that point and say focus on the inflammation reduction um but the other thing that's that's been very interesting for us is that uh light therapy is also a uh, a really good treatment modality for um a lot of neurological pathologies so uh one of the things that we're working on building out a program around now is neuropathy um peripheral neuropathy is a uh is something that presents locally. So your hands, your feet, um, from a, a, a symptom standpoint, but what we're finding out right now that a lot of this is systemic neurological impacts. And so you're, you're seeing things like demyelination or unraveling of the, the kind of, uh, coatings for lack of a better term around your, the cables that are your nerves. Yeah. Uh, and so this, this demyelination isn't isn't just these peripheral areas it's actually being driven upstream a lot uh and so when you start treating by the spine by the ganglia you start treating uh the base of the neck and you add that in with the protocol for treating the local tissue as well the the outcomes are again kind of stacking so you you benefit in more than one way but i think it's one of the things where where we really believe that a lot of what we're dealing with and, and because of the the mitochondrial impact that we have um a lot of the things that we're able to treat uh, from a pathology standpoint have a metabolic basis. Um, and I, I think a lot of the, the neurological symptoms that people are seeing these days uh, does have a, a metabolic basis, whether it's, again, this, this is, you know, uh, in the brain as well. Uh, we, we actually, one of the first products we wanted to, to deliver to the market was a, a brain product uh, for dealing with depression and anxiety. Um, and we we see a huge impact of being able to um, to treat or, or intervene with the metabolic uh, issues that that are kind of drivers for these these neurological pathologies. And and uh, it's a very exciting space to be in. Uh, and we're we're putting a lot of time and energy and resource in to be able to, to provide more meaningful metrics than what we've seen from a, a pain standpoint it's very difficult again pain is is a is a really difficult one to quantify with objective metrics but we're moving in that direction but what we are able to do is quantify the impacts of these metabolic gaps um from a, a uh, cellular level processing standpoint and see how these metabolic uh these metabolic gaps in the brain uh for example can present as pathologies how do those how do those correlate with what what kind of uh, metabolic issues drive depression. What kind of metabolic issues drive uh, anxiety or addiction? And and we are seeing some very high correlations uh, with those, and and we're actually able to impact them in a really positive way. So that's that's one of the most exciting things we're working out uh, working on over the next two years is getting a, a a brain product to market that's able to both address from a treatment standpoint a number of things like the neuropathy you can actually impact with brain treatments as well sure. but also treating yeah it's just it's just kind of a center of, of uh you know neurological tissues so um yeah. long story short we will have a we'll have a product that we can start kind of addressing these metabolic issues with and and really show objective data around in the next in the next two years so when you say metabolic what do you mean by that when you say metabolic i'm thinking blood sugar that kind of stuff what do what are your when you use the term metabolic what are you referring to just general uh, kind of uh, creation, creation and, and processing of energy. Uh, so you, you your body uses a number of different energy substrates, yeah. and how you how you break those down, and how you uh, shuttle those, and then how you use those uh, when there are um, when there are issues uh, in that system. Uh, 
they can, and depending on what type of issue it is, it can present with a number of different pathologies. And so, you know, there's, there's, um, and there's always kind of ways to, to, there's always confounders for this. Uh, as an example with, you know, with free fatty acids uh, in your blood, um, there are some kind of healthy free fatty acids you can find in your blood uh, where, you know, for example, athletes uh, are, are able to use uh, both carbohydrates and effectively use fatty acids, and they're shuttling those around their system. There's also some uh, kind of gummed up or backed up or overflowing uh, free fatty acids to where if you're eating too much um, from a, a carbohydrate and uh, fat standpoint, uh, these are these are actually, your, your, your body's unable to store them Mm. as fast as it should effectively because you've gummed up that system too much. And these, these going through your blood system are a completely different thing than very similar free fatty acids going through your blood system as an energy substrate. If that makes sense. Yeah. 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 So they're driving all kinds of trouble. Basically. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And, but how that, how that trouble. So right now what we're, what we're doing with, um, and, and it's a, it's a new branch of science, new branch of, of, uh, you know, uh, medical applications is, uh, optical sensors. Um, so one of the things that we've seen as an example in the brain uh, that's very mature technology is uh, electrical. Uh, so EEGs, ECGs are, are uh, you know, have been around for decades. They've been very well tested. You get very kind of mature data out of those and we know what we can test with those. Um, one of the things that's that's been more recent is things like functional near-infrared spectroscopy uh, mm -hmm. where we can sense uh, in 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 any with a with an array of of 64 nodes of um laser and and sensor on your head you can now build a topographical map of how energy is used uh well you start with uh total oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin and so you get this picture of where the hemoglobin's going where's the oxygen going you can derive back to how is that how is that oxygen being used in the in the mitochondria from the cytochrome c oxidase in that mitochondrial uh phospholipid bilayer and so yeah. you can see how how effectively your your oxidative phosphorylation is generating energy and and like how how are we how are we processing energy and this is this is kind of what goes back to the the metabolic uh, kind of reference point earlier is it's like what what kind of energy processing geometries do I see in this brain relative to the different brain regions relative to these different pathologies and that's that's kind of where we are right now is digging into these and trying to both unwind which metabolic processes are driving uh, which pathologies, but also when we can treat these transcranially with light, particularly with infrared light, a few different uh, wavelengths of infrared light, we can target these and show immediate differences in how that seg section of the brain is processing energy. And those don't necessarily translate through to immediate pathological improvements, but over time they are. And it's, it's, a, it's a really powerful treatment modality because it's something that's non-invasive, non-addictive, non-pharmaceutical, and is still able to move the needle from a, a pathology standpoint, which again, you know, for us, the entire thing is about the mission of moving the needle for a quality of life. When you look at what depression and anxiety and addiction do to people, it's, it's so soul crushing uh, for so many people that if we can move the needle in a 20 to 30 percent way with introducing these new tools and provide them with real objective data as to how that actually works that's you know that's meaningful for us in our mission absolutely well and it'll be meaningful to a lot of people whose lives will be <laughs> as a result okay so that's that's the that's the brain device that's but you're still a couple of years away from that i mean i would imagine just the regulatory hoops you have to jump through to you know, when you're when you're messing with people's brains yes. <laughs> in a positive way, there's lots of and with good reason, right? Yes. You want to make sure that things are um and then backing it up, you've got you've got another, you've got a vagal tone and gut health product coming down the pipes pretty soon. But in the immediate sense now, we've you've got this kinney on move plus, which you know, you guys, I got to tell you, like, it's, it's a, it's just a very impressive device. Like we've, we've been talking, like I had a friend who's got, um, I think, what was it? He had to have an, his ACL or one of his knee ligaments replaced. So they took a limit, took basically material from another part of his leg, reattached um, what they needed to attach. And he's two years out from the surgery and he's still not 
you know, he's not got his mobility back. He's not being free. So this is a two year old injury. And um, when I got my move plus, I just flipped, I, I lent it to him. I said, look, you use this because I, because I stopped CrossFit three years ago, I don't currently have any injuries. So why don't you use it and see what happens? And I was pretty, you know, I was like, you know, two year old injury. This is chronic pain at this point. This is chronic inflammation. This has been, there's a lot of scar tissue and I was shocked. Like within a week, he came back and said, Nat, I've got to tell you, I think this thing works. <laughs> and after two weeks, he reluctantly returned it. And I'm like, you can keep it. Um, but after two weeks, he, as a matter of fact, I don't know if you saw this, I'll send you the email. He wrote me an email that talks about how, you know, within a few minutes of putting it on, he said, he explained it like he almost felt like his knee was lighter. And I think what it was is the decrease in inflammation and in the increase in blood flow. And so all of a sudden he just felt like he could start to move better. I'm gonna make sure I'm not muted here. The uh, I, I think it's not uncommon though, first of all, I think the, the uh, one of the things that we see a lot with this particular, people don't understand how, how traumatic surgery is to the tissue in the area. And you, you see it for, you know, you, you'll, you know, you'll feel those, those effects ongoing for, uh, for years. And, and again, we've seen folks who, um, one of the NFL guys we were dealing with, uh, had, um, lower temperature in his left leg where he'd had an ACL repair 10 years later. Uh, so this is the thing is really interesting. That's the second time you've brought that up. Is that because the, the mitochondria just aren't working? Like it's just not producing as much energy. Uh, that's actually just because of the, the joint generating more uh, inflammation long-term. So you have chronic inflammation in the joint long-term. That drops and that, the temperature. That's right. And so you you basically, it it reduces the efficacy of the microvasculature in that region, not just in the local tissue, but like, so he had the ACL repair, but his whole quad was about two degrees colder. And we see these cold pools of tissue really, um, really impacting uh, re-injury rates, uh, really okay. impacting imbalances, both, you know, both in that area, but also you'll see things where his hips will be imbalanced because that quad on the left isn't getting as much blood. He can't he can't grow the regrow the muscle or re reheal the muscle tissue as quickly from training, and so that will fatigue faster even five or ten years later uh, because that that blood delivery system just isn't as effective as it was um, due to the the increased inflammation trickle out of the the local tissue in the ACL area. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, that's interesting because you would think and like, you know, automatically the way, because we describe inflammation so often as a fire that's burning, you almost think that there would be more heat. Um, it's, it's a little counterintuitive, but the way you're explaining it, there's just less going on and, and it perpetuates the injury. Right. And so, you know, it's interesting when I get back to Toronto, I'll be, I'll be lending the, I forgot, I didn't have time to bring it back to him before I left, which is too bad. Cause I've been traveling, I'm traveling for five weeks. He could have had five weeks with it, but to me, it'll be really interesting to see with prolonged use um, as much as I'm sure there'll always be a use for it for him. He might be able to go longer between treatments kind of thing at some point eventually. Um, Absolutely. Because, yeah, you, you'll see the the pain reduction it's yeah. it, the downside for it is is um and i'm i'm as bad as anybody about this is i i have an old torn um meniscus injury from wrestling when i was younger when it flares up now i use the device for two weeks and then it feels better and i'm <laughs> yeah and i just I, and i'll still use it once or twice a week uh otherwise but what i really should be using it is daily and building the habits in. And that's that's really what we preach as well is build in stacking habits. So if you have a habit, it doesn't matter if it's a, a good habit or a bad habit. It could be meditation and coffee in the morning, or it could be watching Netflix at night. If you're doing it every day, this doesn't cost you anything extra to put it on. So just, just put it on. You have to waste no extra time. Just stack it with the habits, whatever uh, whatever habits you have, make sure that you're, you're making the most out of them. Yeah, no, that's, that's so smart. And so, okay. So actually I have another question for you. If someone, let's say somebody has a, because you know, someone, many people have a sore knee and a sore elbow or a sore shoulder, you know, there's not just one, one thing. Yes. <laughs> um, so would they be able to use, would it be okay for them from a treatment perspective to use it for 15 minutes on the knee, 15 minutes on the shoulder, and then repeat again at night? Or does that fall into the too much of a good thing model? No, no, those, those are okay. Uh, you can, you can, uh, you can do it 
what we don't want to see is people doing, you know, an hour of local treatment in one area. If you're yeah. doing 15 minutes on, so as an example, if I, if I have a really heavy lower body uh, uh, session today, uh, one, of the, one of the great impacts for this is that it, um, it also reduces delayed onset muscle soreness, which is really effective if you're training a lot. <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll actually treat both legs uh, twice in the morning and in the evening um, if I'm going on, on a really heavy day because it'll, it keeps me from being kind of stiff and, and immobile for the next day as well. Yeah, no kidding. Although you own the company, so you might own two, so be able to do both knees at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> no, even if I have two, my, my wife's going to have the other one somewhere. It'll, oh, I, I never get to keep both. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, um, is there anything else you wanted to cover? Is, did Did we leave anything out? Do we need? Is there Is there a gaping hole somewhere we didn't get to? No, no. I, I think you know. I. Uh, it, Really, the the uh, the main thing is, if if anybody has questions about this, um, you know, feel free to reach out. One thing that that again that really aligns with our mission, and we've tried to tried to make uh, everything from a tactical and strategic standpoint really align around this mission. My partner Tom and I have have made ourselves available and posted our our Calendly uh, links uh, so that anybody who wants to know more about this, uh, any user who's having any problems with it. If someone's having an issue with one of the things that we've seen as an example with people using this for knee pain um, is if you put the knee at the 90 degree angle, then you can actually access the knee line that gets you into the into the joint fluid and the joint capsule. Um, but we'll, we'll see people who are saying, ah, this is crazy. It doesn't work. And then we just have to go back in and, and work with them on the protocol. But our job is moving the needle for people on a quality of life standpoint. So any anyone who wants to, uh, you know, you can find Tom or myself or any of our team at uh, Kenyon, K-I-N-E-O-N dot I-O. Um, and we're happy to jump on. Uh, we, we really are here. This is a, a mission-driven company. We're here to move the needle. Um, you know, reach out to us if you have any issues with, with anything or if you have questions as to what it might be applicable to. Yeah, no, I love it. And actually, even on your website, I was just on there earlier today, and when you go to the chat, there's a video of you and you literally <laughs> standing there saying, hey, welcome to our site. What can I help you with today? And I'm like, holy jumping. They're taking this to the next level here. <laughs> Never mind a chat bot. There's a video of the guy. <laughs> awesome. All right. So, and you you ship worldwide? We do ship worldwide. Uh, we, we have some issues with a couple of countries like South Africa had some problems importing and I think Brazil has some problems importing, but we support that and we work you through it. So again, that's that's one of the ones where we want to make it as widely available uh, to help the, the large number of people we can. I love it. Thank you so much. Okay. So guys, if you decide um, that the Move Plus is something you want to kind of check out, go to kineon.io, as Forrest just said. So that's K-I-N-E-O-N.io. And you can use code NAT10 and save yourself 10% off your purchase. I think, um, well, we're recording this. I don't think this podcast will be out in time, but maybe you'll we'll add you to the Father's Day gift list, I think, or Mother's Day, frankly. I mean, <laughs> this is definitely <laughs> a gender-neutral gift. Um, but... Um, <laughs> But yeah, I think I, you know, it's a it's a great little device, and and when I say little, it's tiny but mighty. It's like it's super light. So, uh, congratulations on your success with this. I can't wait to see the new stuff that's coming down the pipes from you guys. <laughs> Thank you so much, and re really enjoyed having this discussion with you today. Thank you for all the great questions and, and interaction. And we are definitely going to put you on the list for our, our our beta users for the next the next products coming out. I think you'll enjoy them. Amazing. I love being a guinea pig. It's totally my jam. All right. Thanks a lot. All right. All right. Thank you.